Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton, and this is the Empire and Deep State series that I at Multipolarista am co-hosting with the American Exception podcast, hosted by friends of the show Aaron Good and Seamus McGinnis. And as always, we are talking today about the book American Exception, Empire and the Deep State by the historian and political scientist Aaron Good, the co-host of this program. And we are now in part 12. We've gone through many different theories and analysis of imperialism, of the deep state, of different you know, political science analysis of where power lies, what the state is. We've talked about a lot of that. And today we're basically beginning a kind of new part in the series, which is the history focus section. I'm personally very excited about this. This is where I really, you know, I, I, I'm most interested in these topics. I really cut my teeth on this stuff. So, you know, we're going to begin at the beginning, as, as they say, and we're going to start here with a history of the U.S. national security state and the deep state that was constructed after World War II. And this is based on chapter six in Aaron's book. And for the most part, from now on, a lot of these episodes are going to be built around history. We're going to talk about theory and stuff, but largely around history. And Aaron, this chapter is one of my favorite chapters in the book. It's a brilliant chapter. And it has a great name. It's an imperial colossus is born. An imperial colossus is born. You're talking about the creation of the U.S. empire and the national security state after the end, or not even before the end, toward the end of World War II. And you talk about the, you talk about the different institutions that are involved, but specifically you talk about the key role of the Council on Foreign Relations acting as an arm of Wall Street, of big corporations, you know, big capitalists, and their plans to create what they called an American century. That's important because when we talk about the neoconservatives today and their project for the new American century, they're, of course, acknowledging the original American century. But this history is not very well known, even though this history has probably, this, these, these historical events that we're talking about in the 1940s, are probably some of the most influential historical events in the past 100 years that fundamentally shifted global politics and economics and created the world we live in today. So let, let's just start by talking about how the post-World War II U.S. empire emerged. And I'll start, I'll just open this kind of generally with this ridiculous quote, this famous quote from a British court historian, John Robert Seeley. He famously claimed, that the British acquired their empire in a fit of absence of mind, claiming that, it, you know, it was just a mistake. It was an accident that the British created their empire. And that's that's exactly how the U.S. treats its empire. Oh, the U.S. didn't actually go, it didn't have a plan to create an empire. It's all just an accident that this happened the way it did. But of course, you spell out that it's not in any way an accident. So, so help us explain how the post-war American empire was created. I think it's important to understand that the U.S. has always been an oligarchy of sorts. There were democratic elements of the U.S. political system and U.S. society, but there has been, an, you know, there's also top-down power in American history. And uh, there's a great quote. So FDR said to Colonel House in 1933 in a letter, Colonel House is the famous advisor to Woodrow Wilson and a guy who'd been around the higher circles of U.S. power in the early part of the 20th century. FDR writes to him, the real truth is, as you and I know, that a financial element in the larger centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson. So that's... Um, coming from FDR himself, who is the president of the United States and a guy who is connected to the, uh, you know, elites. Uh, his family has money made from opium trade, the Delano family, the China trade, as it was called. So he would know. And he's pointing out that there's a, the, this country has been owned and run by you know, wealthy people since the days of Andrew Jackson, which is an interesting statement, may have to do with the fact that the end of the uh, Second Bank of the United States leads to in effect, the power of Wall Street, Wall Street becoming the main financial center of the United States without really any competition. Philadelphia was where the Second Bank of the United States was located, and it was a more national bank, more nationalized bank, still with some private ownership and kind of a weird structure when you think about it. But still, when you when the bank ends, Andrew Jackson 
you know, can present himself as a guy who's like the anti-banker type person, but it really helped to further empower uh, financial elements that had no connection to the government at all. So private finance really benefited from uh, the end of Andrew Jackson. And that's so FDR can allude to the fact that an oligarchy emerged around the time of Andrew Jackson, and he was accurate. So in the case of the U.S. after World War II, oligarchy uh, really takes, takes, the, takes the wheel. Uh, in terms of steering U.S. grand strategy. Uh, they, they establish this War and Peace Studies project, uh, which it, we've talked about, mentioned a few times before now. But this is right after the Soviets invade, um, the, or the, sorry, the Germans invade Poland in 1939. Very shortly, this whole thing begins. So the U.S. hasn't even entered the war, um, and it's not really certain they're go they, that they're going to. They're not making you know, statements to that effect. But these guys already get to work and they more or less establish it's the War and Peace Studies Project under the State Department auspices. But it's really undertaken by s some amount of State Department pers personnel, but mostly the Council on Foreign Relations. And it's all paid for by the uh, Rockefeller Foundation. And so this is oil, standard oil money. And the Council on Foreign Relations is a Rockefeller organization as well. Very Eastern establishment, kind of Anglophile, you know, connected to the roundtable groups. Uh, of like Milner and um, Cecil Rhodes in England, you know, copied on that model. It's a really British imperialist kind of mindset, which makes sense because these guys are like, they have a, uh, a transnational commercial imperialist, you know, uh, mindset themselves. It's the upper echelons of U.S. capitalism. And you see here on the, uh, this, this, these images are taken from the actual report themselves. Vice president at the time was Alan Dulles. OK, and that's probably the real face of the American empire uh, in its early days and the way it was constructed. And the, he's a person who worked for the U.S. government, the OSS, during the World War One or, or during World War Two. And he was a part of a diplomatic delegation to Versailles in World War One. So he goes way back and the establishment has a. Uh, relatives who were secretary two relatives who were secretary of state his brother goes on to become secretary of state so this is this connection between the government and financial elites and somebody like dulles is more or less a leg man for these people and he wrote two sections of this report which are still classified on security and sovereignty and people speculate that this was uh where he calls for the creation of something like a cia to be able to manage these affairs internationally so this yeah, was and, not and aaron we should point out also that Alan Dulles was, of course, a Wall Street lawyer who then was brought into the Council on Foreign Relations and then eventually creates the CIA. So his background as a Wall Street lawyer is very important. Right. The the uh, the, ba the overlap between like what you could call oil intelligence when he was working for Sullivan and Cromwell, but also like working on oil deals and still had a State Department appointment. I mean, this goes back a long time. You used to have a lot of standard oil employees in the State Department in general in the uh in the late 18, in the Gilded Age, in the early 1900s. So this is kind of par for the course. Sullivan and Cromwell, Wall Street law firm, represents the biggest corporate clients in the world. The Dulles brothers are a part of that. And so the main takeaway here is that this whole this whole uh, decision of the U.S. to take on the mantle of global leadership was formulated while World War II was going on in an undemocratic way by very wealthy or organizations backed by very wealthy people. And they plan out a much of the structure of the post-war world order. They they argue for things like the IMF, what becomes the IMF, what becomes the World Bank later, what becomes the United Nations, probably what becomes the CIA, although those reports are still classified. And so these are major pillars of the way the U.S. is going to run the world. And they decided they would go for this. So it definitely was not something done in a fit of absence of mind. It was done very deliberately. Um, in in secret, some of it's still secret today. Plan to assert global dominance. So, in a way, you could say it's you know, kind of a conspiratorial way to to do all of this, since it really wasn't debated uh, openly and all that it that in, it entailed for the U.S. Uh, so, no, not a fit of absence of mind. Very much planned by oligarchic elements. Right, and and we're talking about the construction of the empire. Uh, you know, there are these sort of preceding ideas around things like the Monroe Doctrine and sort of this this sense that we have a right to interfere and to control our hemisphere, and that very quickly expands to the world as soon as we sort of assert ourselves as a world power. 
And on the flip side, I think the, you know, we're talking about history now, the let's call it mainstream or your, you know, if you took U.S. history in, in high school, that version of the story kind of separates out the sort of George Cannon long telegram story from the cultural one, which is that, okay, we had McCarthyism. Oh, there was this anti-communist hysteria, but we kind of keep those siloed off from each other. And I think what we're getting at here is there's a reason why that that's maybe obscured, but how does this thinking in the sort of upper echelons, things like the War and Peace Studies Project, get from the public state or the, not the public state, but from the sort of early uh, birth of the deep state to the general American culture that controls our, our political system and what we talk about and our media and sort of that, that influence on the greater um, American experience that this, uh, that this budding empire had? Well, I think that the main push to present this to the American public, uh, you can see in this quote from Henry Luce in the, uh, his famous American Century essay. I mean, he, he, well, he writes, all, this whole essay is basically pitching American leadership on the world and how America is going to be this benevolent leader uh, of global free enterprise system and so on. Uh, so it doesn't pitch itself. At, it says the American Century but it, it studiously avoids calling itself like empire or imperialist. And then yeah, and Aaron, explain who Henry Luce is really quickly for people who don't know. Yeah, Henry Luce is a guy who was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he was the main sort of official publisher with the seal of approval of the overworld of uh, American capitalism, more or less. So he published Time Magazine, Life Magazine, and Fortune Magazine, and he had a very pro-capitalist, you know, pro-American uh, perspective, and he was able to uh, run this media empire in such a way as to promote the values and interests and perceptions uh, and public relations aims of uh, the American oligarchy. So, and and a lot of it is kind of pablum for PR purposes. But he he slips up in one point here in the uh, in this essay, and I think kind of gives away some some more serious aspects of what he's talking about. He writes. Our thinking of world trade today is on ridiculously small terms. For example, if we think of Asia, uh, we think of Asia as being worth only a few hundred millions a year to us. Actually, in the decades to come, Asia will be worth to us exactly zero or else it will be worth to us four, five, ten billions of dollars a year. And the latter are the terms we must think in or else confess a pitiful impotence. And of course, in 1941, the this is written in February of 1941. Pearl Harbor hasn't happened yet, but the there's an empire. There are empires in East Asia, and Japan is basically has is taking them over, and they're Western empires. So they've already taken over French Indochina by this point, and uh, there had this this war machine is is set has its eyes set on the rest of the European empires over there. And those are very valuable, very lucrative, especially Indonesia. People connected to the Council on Foreign Relations knew that Indonesia, West Papua, um, if, which is the Dutch East Indies, had a ridiculous amount of gold, for example. And if the Japanese had been allowed to maintain control over that area of the world, they would have become a very rich empire. And uh, a lot of corporate interests in the U.S. would not have been able to make ridiculous amounts of money in the decades after World War II like they have up to the present day. Even the Freeport mine in West Papua uh, is the richest gold mine in the world still today. And uh, we probably don't even know the half of it. They probably obscure how much they actually get out of it. And so this is really what was at stake. It was a, who was going to own the valuable resources of the world. And this gets packaged as, you know, spreading freedom and democracy in the American way and the, the free enterprise system, which is a, a quite a euphemism for capitalism. Uh, and that's, that's Henry Luce. And that's how it was presented to the American public. Yeah, and of course, this is very reminiscent of the language that we would see in the 1950s after the victory of the Chinese Revolution in October 1st, 1949, when Mao famously says, China has stood up, has risen up, overthrown its colonial shackles. And then we saw all of this, this media noise in the U.S. with the press saying, who lost China? How did we lose China? And clearly, if you lose something, you have to own it before you lose it, right? So the, the narrative that he's getting at there is that if we don't act and create this global spanning empire, we're going to lose Asia. 
we're going to lose billions and billions of dollars, which I'm sure if you adjusted it for inflation, it would be, you know, hundreds of billions or trillions today. So, I mean, it's it's really important to keep in mind that this this idea of the U.S. losing China and losing Asia is it's strictly it's simply colonialism. That's exactly how colonialists think. But what's interesting about this, Aaron, is when in your book, when you talk about the role of these Wall Street lawyers and the Council on Foreign Relations and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, you know, this is all Wall Street money working with the State Department to create this plan for a global U.S. empire. And yet this plan is being created at the same time that the U.S. government does have what is probably the most progressive government in its history under FDR. And there are people in the administration who actually are against this plan, especially you talk a lot about the vice president, Henry Wallace, who is the second most popular, pre uh, the second most popular politician in the U.S. after FDR. And yet he's been completely erased from history, which is an incredible act of you know, historical erasure. How, how was this contradiction kind of reconciled or was it reconciled? How do you have these U.S. corporate elites from Wall Street creating this plan in the State Department for a massive U.S. empire at the same time that you have in the White House progressives who don't want a Cold War and who don't want to create an empire like that? Well, this, I think, gets it, it is a case that illustrates the real limits of, um, of liberal democracy. It, it really shows that uh, you cannot uh, have a... The, the fundamental basis of a democratic society is that it's the public that controls the state and, the, and that it operates in the public interest and the interest of the majority. But you see with this case that even at, at, when, it's at, when the U.S. is at its most democratic... There's nothing to stop the uh, oligarchic forces from asserting control of the state and determining the course of history. And they, at the time that this was happening, because there were progressive elements in the state and because unregulated capitalism had been discredited, they sought to uh, depict this, to couch this in progressive rhetoric that's much more progressive than what the U.S. says today. I mean, famously during World War II, you had uh, FDR talking about the four freedoms, and these were uh, advertised in and posted and you know promoted in the U.S. as uh, you know in car in images by Norman Rockwell. So if you uh, can see Norman Walk Rockwell painting here, talking about the four freedoms: freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear, and this was uh, something that was people were to fight for. And this was something that the U.S. was saying should apply to the whole world. And uh, freedom from want is quite notable here. This is a this is something that if you think like progress sort of moves on uh, in, in a kind of incremental way and so on, uh, you think, well, this freedom from want, this providing material security for people, why is that still out of reach? Why do we still have tens of thousands of people dying every day from preventable diseases and malnutrition that could be eradicated for a fraction of the cost of uh, the Pentagon budget. And you see th the conclusion is that they were this sort of thinking was rolled back and was destroyed in America. And uh, it was useful to mobilize people to support this war effort because it was a good cause and it was you couldn't really say make the world safe for democracy after Woodrow Wilson. So there was more that was promised and I think that Roosevelt was not insincere insofar as he was behind, you know, supported these ideas. Ditto, in, and even more so for Henry Wallace, his vice president from 1940, uh, you know, after the 1940 election. But even at this time, you had right-wing elements who were, you know, not excited about this, but they didn't want to be contradicting the president and so on. But they would, they put a whole campaign out about the fifth freedom, okay, which is the, the fifth freedom is the U.S. free enterprise system. So, you know, capitalism was would not does not really fit with these four freedoms, but these guys just because they have enough money, they can create a pre-R campaign to just crudely put that out there. Okay. So even at this point freedom to exploit. Exactly. I mean, that's you know, capitalism is that's is based on that on exploitation. You know, it's basically that that the market and explo exploitative market mechanisms should prevail through as much of society as possible. 
And when it, where it doesn't prevail, they're, they they kind of want to go after those things, public education, you know, public roads. They'd like to make everything a toll booth, et cetera, et cetera. Because that's just what they, that's the mindset of these people. So this was uh, a contradiction of the time. And it really shows how weak uh, U.S. democracy was, even at its strongest point. Um, and there was an anti-fascist, uh, there were a lot of anti-fascist sentiments in the United States as well, and they were fighting against fascism in World War II, so it was good to have an anti-fascist as vice president. But here's Henry Wallace talking about American fascists. If we define an American fascist as one who, in case of conflict, puts money and power ahead of human beings, then there are undoubtedly several million fascists in the United States. Okay, <laughs> now that is... That defines so many people in the United States and in the United States power structure. Uh, and so Wallace is basically pointing out that these people should probably be considered fascists uh, then and now. And he was very popular. Uh, Wallace was very popular, second most popular politician, as you say, in the United States. And he only was able to be the vice president in 1940 because uh, FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt intervened to say that uh, basically uh, FDR would would lead, would drop himself from the ticket if, if Wallace wasn't the vice president. They, they basically, it's a dramatic sort of showdown. And then so they let Wallace uh, become president, but in 19, or vice president. But in 1944, you have what's called Polly's coup, where um, Claude Pepper, Florida senator, was going to nominate um, Henry Wallace for the vice presidential position at the Democratic Convention, and he gets within five feet of the uh, of the microphone, and then people are alarmed because they know what, what he's going to do, and so they fake a, fa a fire. They say there's a fire, and they got to evacuate the building, and so because if he'd been able to nominate him that night, he would have won hands down, and so there was a conspiracy by this guy named Pauly, who was the Democratic Party treasurer and a California oil millionaire. And they basically um, scuttled Henry Wallace's vice presidential chances and get him dropped from the ticket, despite the fact that he's extremely popular. And they replace him with Harry Truman. Why do they replace him with Harry Truman? Not that he had distinguished himself in any way, but he hadn't offended anyone. And he said certain things that kind of give you a hint as to his mentality. For example, he said, as a senator, if we see that Germany is winning, we ought to help Russia. And if Russia is winning, we ought to help Germany. And that way, let them kill as many as possible. Huh. So that logic is kind of, uh, a, you know, fitting in terms of describing what the U.S. did in the early years of World War II. Even after, even after Pearl Harbor, they they wait to go into Europe until basically the war is the Russians have turned the tide uh, and are marching towards Berlin. Um, and so this is this is this reflects what the kind of uh, you know, thinking of Harry Truman, it also reflects the Cold War mentality as well. I mean, it just shows that like they're more concerned about dominance and global dominance than um, really having peace, especially in Germany or Russia, that they'd rather they'd rather pit them against each other, which they do in the Cold War. So this was this was a tragedy. Uh, Wallace was really progressive and his plans were more for the century of the common man. He put out a counterpoint to Henry Luce. Uh, in a speech called the century of the common man and he talks about how this shouldn't be an american century it should be a century of the, co of the common man where technology in the west is dispersed throughout the world to allow people to develop their societies and solve material technological problems uh, and more or less create a, a just world that kind of conforms to the idea behind the four freedoms uh, and that that would be the way that america could could have a leadership position but a benevolent one uh, instead of an exploitative one but of course, that wasn't that wasn't to be. So on the subject of that that Truman quote, I think we see throughout World War II, and I, I don't want to um, discount the sort of, I, I think the American populace itself, obviously there is a fascist element in America prior to the war. And then a lot of people genuinely who at least were aware of what was happening in Germany were joining for the right reasons. And, and I guess what I'm trying to say is we have to step outside of the sort of Manichaean um, uh, duality of World War II of like the U.S. is on the side of good and it's against evil because ostensibly that's what's happening. But of course, the people who are founding this sort of new plan coming out of it see it very differently. And the real goal is not really to take a side as much as it is to su subordinate everybody involved. And so the way that that happens, 
in in Germany is obviously a lot more of the conventional warfare way, firebombing the industry, except GM factories. You leave those alone, even though they were producing military equipment. And then on the flip side, you have things like Lend-Lease that are subordinating the British Empire uh, by essentially taking away all of their imperial preference uh, uh, trade empire. And that was sort of the new developing way of having a capitalist empire was to have that sort of unequal exchange set up. And we understood that. And so Lend-Lease was given on the terms that that would be taken away. And because we understood that quote unquote free markets really meant that it was our time to take over. And, um, and so by the time we get to 1947, somebody like Secretary of State Dean Acheson says, there's really only two great powers left. And what he's referring to is the US and the USSR. So by the end of the war, you're, you see all of the European powers that are supposedly our allies uh, are not our equals. And, um, and so as the war leads on, as we're saying, this sort of the birth of a new American century comes about. So at what moment would you say that the U.S. deep state or what you call the imperial colossus is born? So it's tricky to put an exact birth date on like a birth certificate of the United, of the United States deep state. But uh, Mike, Lo Mike Lofgren, who wrote a, a, a decent book on the deep state, kind of a, a limited hangout in some ways because he, he under, underplays the, the, the criminality of it all. But um, Lofgren wrote that the attainment of the nuclear weapon was almost certainly the deep state's moment of conception. Well, I would dispute that and say it's probably more accurate to describe the atomic bombings as the deep state's birth well after it was conceived by the war and peace studies project. So they get this idea, comes together in the war and peace studies project, is conceived there, and then it violently bursts onto the world scene with the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So these nuclear bombs were totally gratuitous. Um, I think Peter Dale, Peter Kuznick has done the, uh, perhaps the most exhaustive work on on this. Uh, that's that's accessible, very accessible as well in uh, Untold History of the United States documentary and the book series. The nukes were totally gratuitous, and people like uh, six or seven of those five star generals, if I remember correctly, six or seven of them thought they were either unnecessary, immoral, or both. Uh, Eisenhower and even Curtis LeMay thought that they were not that they didn't need to be done. Uh, Japan surrendered when they surrendered because of the Soviet invasion of Manchuria. So those things happened. The, the Soviets rushed to be able to enter the war as they had promised they would do at like Yalta and Potsdam. And they, uh, the last remaining bit of an extraterritorial empire that the Japanese had was in Manchuria. And the Soviets came in same time that the bombs were, uh, you know, the, right after the drop, the bombing of Hiroshima and right before and before the bombing of Nagasaki, but it's like a day later, right? They sweep into Manchuria and they wipe everything out there. Uh, they, they wipe out the Japanese. The Japanese people lose more in the invasion of Manchuria than they lost in the atomic bombings, okay, which kill you know a couple hundred thousand people. Uh, but the the losses in Manchuria were even more devastating. They were a totally defeated empire. The U.S knew that the invasion, the Soviet invasion was coming. They did not need to drop the bomb on Hiroshima. They could have waited to see what the invasion would have, would have done, but for, they wanted to use the bomb, the, uh, apparently to teach the Soviet Union a lesson. The co-director of the Manhattan Project, General Leslie Groves, said himself that there was never any doubt in his mind that the real target of the bomb was the Soviet Union from, the, from when the project started and on. Um, when there was a cabinet meeting of the Japanese after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the main subject they talked about as they were discussing the option of surrender was the USSR invasion. They didn't really talk about the losses of Hiroshima and Nagasaki much at all. The, the atomic bomb explanation kind of becomes a convenient myth for both sides. Uh, it become because it for the Japanese, they have to ask why they didn't surrender earlier and why they surrendered to the Americans and how they could become so close to the Americans if the Americans gratuitously bombed them that way. Uh, in reality, surrendering to the Americans instead of the Russians meant that they would keep their oligarchy in place, their ruling class in place. And so this uh, gratuitous bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is really, uh, and the message it sends to the Soviets, which it kind of terrifies them and induces a lot of panic in the Soviet Union at this time, uh, 
Um, this is this ha this I think should be seen as the birth of the American deep state. This kind of top-down power that's going to assert itself in violent ways uh, to direct the course of history and to sort of uh, override any sort of democratic decision making. And for the U.S. at this point, they're the only da undamaged great power. They have a monopoly on the nuclear weapons. They have over half of the world's industry, uh, industrial production. They have the largest gold reserves by far just on paper. And, pro and that's uh, just a fraction of it because they recover enormous amounts of Axis gold, both in, uh, in Europe and in East Asia. And a lot of these go to fund covert operations and things like the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan, the sort of ruling one party of Japan that's existed to the present day. We don't even really know about these angles, but the so this is a, another example of just deep political power uh, turn, taking over and America becoming uh, essentially an empire as per the designs of its oligarchic class, the, the overworld of corporate wealth. So Aaron, part of the narrative that was used to justify the first Cold War was the idea that the Soviet Union was hell, hell bent on world domination. They were trying to overthrow all independent governments. Of course, we know now that's pretty ridiculous. And and I, I should say that a book that we've talked about in this series is The Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg. And that book is, I think, very important because it shows that he, when he was working at the Rand Corporation, which is basically an arm of the Pentagon, they all knew that the Soviet Union, at least from a military perspective, was not in any way threatening the West or really the world, that U.S. military might was always significantly more advanced. The U.S. military technology, missiles, nuclear weapons were all significantly more advanced. So talk about this narrative that was used to justify the first Cold War and the creation of this empire by trying to inflate the threat supposedly posed by the Soviet Union. You know, as you allude to, the Soviet Union was not in, had been fighting a, a brutal war. Really, the, 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 so, but the Soviet losses in World War II exceed anything ever experienced in the history of human civilization. They, they lost 26.6 .6 million people to the United States, 400,000. Okay, which means that that gets rounded up to 27 million. So it gets rounded up 400,000. So basically the U.S. losses in comparison to the Soviet losses are a rounding error. Okay, it's it's astounding what the Soviet Union suffered during that war. Stalin had begged the U.S. to enter the war earlier. Uh, Churchill really lobbied against that, wanted them more to protect the British Empire in Northern Africa especially. Uh, and so they really leave the Soviets to uh, to do the bulk of the fighting. And uh, the USSR, it gets described after the fact that the, the Soviets are really treacherous and that they went back on their word. But this really wasn't the case. Uh, it, it came out that eventually that, by and large, Stalin had adhered to those th the things that they had agreed at Yalta and at other conferences. And there's even a surviving document that you can see, uh, on, you can find online. Uh, it's called the Percentage percentages documents. I have found a picture of it. So you can actually see in this sort of famous or infamous document, which Churchill called the naughty document. <laughs> and uh, it was sort of put down on a scrap of paper that was nearby, also known as the percentages agreement. But it's Stalin and Churchill at the fourth Moscow conference in October of 1944, uh, dividing up the Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. So they, you see Yugoslavia is like a 50-50 split um, it, for influence, um, and you know, Bulgaria, Greece on here, the, the British and the Americans would end up controlling Greece. That was seemed to be part of the deal. Uh, and Stalin really sticks to this. In fact, it causes a rift between the Yugoslavia and uh, the Soviet Union, a kind of a split in the communist world over this because Tito wants to support the Greeks who are fighting against the monarchists and so on, and they are leftists. And uh, Stalin says, are you crazy? The, the Americans will never accept uh, losing Greece. Uh, it's like a key to their plans in the Mediterranean. They're never going to tolerate this. So Stalin stuck to the plan. Tito was more idealistic about it. Um, but Stalin adhered mostly to these uh, to these agreements. So it was really the, the U.S. side uh, that, that was more duplicitous about this. 
And even sort of liberal normie historians like uh, Eric Alterman has ha have written about this. This is this shouldn't be especially controversial to say that that the Soviets essentially adhered to these agreements, but the U.S. for Cold War purposes mischaracterized Soviet actions to say that they were not uh, honoring uh, agreements and that they were aggressive. So this is this is a key part of how the the Cold War mythology gets established, um, and. I'll just I'll go ahead and elaborate this chronology here as to the main events of the that led to the Cold War. So you have George Kennan and his long telegram, which comes out in 1946. This is uh, sort of famously uh, described as setting the main ideological framework for containment. And the way that the Soviet Union gets depicted is, uh, you know, in very dire terms. Uh, in summary. Writes, Aaron, Aaron, I'm sorry to cut you off, but you should just really briefly mention who Kennan was. He was, of course, a major diplomat who who had served in the Soviet Union and knew it from the inside. Yeah, Kennan was a guy in the State Department, and he his boss was Dean Acheson, and he was contemplating uh, resigning from the or quitting the Foreign Service before too long. Uh, when he wrote this, he writes this. It seems partly to please uh, Dean Acheson, his boss. So he, he has some insider knowledge about the Soviets, but there's an, there's an element of kind of careerism here also in his dire depictions of the Soviet Union, I think. So, uh, and in, in, in part, he describes them, you know, in a way here that I think is very useful for people who wanted a Cold War and who needed a Cold War for their sort of geopolitical strategy following the war. Uh, Kennan wrote, in summary, we have here a political force committed fanatically to the belief that with the U.S. there can be no permanent modus vivendi. The problem of how to cope with this force is undoubtedly the greatest task our diplomacy has ever faced and probably the greatest it will ever have to face. It was written as a telegram, so it's like the wording is a little weird. Um, but he's, it's, he's saying this is like this huge challenge to the U.S. and they believe that they cannot exist with the United States. This was just not true. This, the Russians and the Soviets wanted to exist with the United States. They would have liked to have had some of the aid that went to Western Europe to help rebuild their society, which they had lost as the America's supposed ally in that war, doing all the fighting. So yeah, this Aaron, is speaking of speaking of aid after World War II, in terms of the Marshall Plan, there actually was money offered to the USSR but but it was less than what was offered to the defeated Nazi Germany. And at that point, I think it was uh, it was more disrespect than anything else. And so the sense was fine, we'll we'll go rebuild on our own rather than sort of ex accepting something so embarrassingly small compared to the people who just killed millions of our uh, from our country and destroyed 25 years of, of wealth uh, and just sort of snuffed all that out from from a huge amount of people just kind of made all of that disappear, all of this productive capacity, some like 75% uh, consumption drops by like a, a, about half. Like it, it's such a huge plummet in economic consumption. And Europe sees all this money pour in uh, some like $12 billion or, or something like that, which is you know massive in today's money. And compare that to they offer more to Nazi Germany than they do to the USSR, who then declines it, obviously. Yeah. And and you know, people talk about how important Lend-Lease was, and it was important to help provide military materiel, weapons, tanks to defeat the Nazis, but that wasn't free money. That was aid, and the Soviet Union, and then later post-Soviet Russian Federation, were for, for, forced to pay back those billions and billions of dollars to the U.S., and didn't actually pay it back until the mid-2000s. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, and there were there were also strings attached to the Marshall Fund that um, were not going to be acceptable to the Soviet Union, and probably intentionally put in there to make sure that that didn't happen. So that that also ends up being the case with arms control and nuclear weapons control later. Uh, that it gets poisoned by the U.S. who puts in uh, measures that they know will be unacceptable to the Soviet leadership. And so they don't, they're not able to cooperate, but then you can blame the Soviets and say, oh, look, they backed out. Um, so also in, so shortly after Kennan issues the long telegram, <clears throat> which I think you have to see Dean Acheson's hand there as well. You have um, the Iron Curtain speech in March of 1946 from Winston Churchill, where he describes how this Iron Curtain has been laid across Europe. And this is kind of an aggressive saber rattling speech, you know, right after the end of World War II. 
Uh, in March of 1947, you have Truman's Truman Doctrine speech, where he often says that the U.S. will support free peoples who are endangered uh, around the world. And it doesn't really make much of a distinction between like vital and not so vital uh, American security interests. So this is another escalation of the Cold War. It's really uh, in large part about the Greeks uh, and the civil war going on in Greece and also, you know, events in Italy that are coming down the pike. 1947, the U.S. Si Truman signs the National Security Act. This creates the CIA, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the National Security Council. Um, and this is uh, the, the real sec national security state uh, structure of the U.S. empire is, is, is basically laid out at this time. CIA gets created at the behest of Wall Street lawyers and bankers, people like Alan Dulles of Sullen, Sullivan and Cromwell, Ferdinand Eberstadt and James Forrestal of Dylan Reed, uh, a Wall Street investment bank. And within this passage, within the National Security Act, there's a, uh, the elastic clause uh, that Clark Clifford uh, put into it, which is very banal sounding, uh, that the CIA would, quote, perform such other functions and duties related to intelligence affecting the national security as the National Security Council may from time to time direct. So it just sort of obliquely says the CIA will do some other things that the National Security Council tells it to. Doesn't specify what that is, but of course like it coups, means- Like assassinations, rigging elections. Sexual blackmail. Other activities. Yeah, exotic forms of assassination and so on. I mean, everything under the sun, mind control programs, uh, everything that you can think of. Uh, and so this is, you know, this is put in there in 1947. In 1948, you have NSC 10-2, which elaborates on covert operations. And I'll give you a little quote here from the, uh, the document itself. Covert operations are so planned and executed that any U.S. government responsibility for them is not evident to unauthorized persons and that if uncovered, the U.S. government can plausibly disclaim any responsibility for them. So already uh, a year after the CIA has established their laying out the sort of uh, legal, I mean, it's, you can't even call it a legal justification. It's more of a declaration of just how it's going to be in these kind of national security documents. And because you've defined the Soviet Union as an existential threat bent on global domination with which there can be no peaceful modus vivendi, then you set the stage for being able to justify this kind of uh, state state power. And it's not, these documents were kept secret. It's not like the public was debating like, well, wait, what does it mean if we're going to have a, a, you know, an intel, a secret service doing all these things and then lying about it? Isn't this going to be kind of anti, anti-American, sort of a more of a imperial monarchist kind of an institution, which it was, it was pretty much uh, taking things that we would have, been against philosophically uh, for the British Empire and adapting them to the American case. And since it's kind of problematic, they just got around that by not talking about covert operations. So it's like a it's very similar to the covert operations themselves. We're 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 not going to be honest about what policies actually are because we can use covert operations to make things happen and then say they didn't even happen. And we're not even going to be honest about the fact that we've assumed this power of using. Uh, covert operations to as a as a means to implement policy so this is it's doubly it's creating a, a layers of secrecy and obfuscation and historical stupefaction of the american people uh and, and it's you know profoundly anti-democratic and it's established very early on in the cold war you have you have the berlin airlift around this time as well which gets depicted as soviet aggression when soviets are taking actions that are uh, reasonable considering that they actually really fear a united uh, Germany again. And they, they preferred for a sort of pastoralized uh, new, neutral Germany uh, that would be broken up. But that wasn't what the, the U.S. takes steps to introduce a currency to get uh, for the whole, for all the other non-Soviet blocs. And Berlin is right there and really what should be on the eastern side, but it's considered part of the West. So they have this uh, big airlift. You have a war scare, which we'll talk about more in 1948, which is, uh, you know, exaggerated for sort of nefarious purposes. And then in 1949, you have the the communists winning in China and the Soviet development of the atomic bomb. And so all these events happen under Truman's, you know, term. And these are the early uh, the early stages of the Cold War. These are the sort of main events, and they're all depicted as 
communism aggressively on the march and a force bent on overthrowing you know everything that america holds sacred uh they're the mat there they become the manichaean devil that justifies whatever the u.s empire wants to do and it, it isn't until uh uh you know as time goes on here we have the early u.n established things like that and there's sort of a ostensible loyalty to some principles of national sovereignty and anti-colonialism that the u.s is using because they understand and and a lot of these same people are are you know commissioning studies and looking at the way that it matters the way that the world sees us and that they don't think that we are instituting an empire so there's sort of a an effort to recast the soviets as imperialists and um and the ussr is able to sort of act as a shield at least at the un because they have veto power in the security council things like that that um they step out of it until after the korean war when they realize like how costly uh giving away that sort of legitimacy back to the un and by extension to the us uh is and so they sort of rejoin the quote unquote international community at least enough to try and uh involve themselves in third world movements enough to throw some sort of weight around behind them but uh, like you were saying it, it's there is no threat of communist invasion of of europe and to whatever extent that there is uh, a communist threat as it were abroad it's the fact that the communists were uh, almost always almost the only uh sort of partisan like resistance forces uh during nazi, nazi occupation of europe and and elsewhere and um and so that has provided a lot of sort of like internal popularity but uh, coming out of that the us has to sort of recast the narrative while also internally making all of these plans to uh to ratchet up the tension because the more that there's sort of a, a perceived security threat domestically the more we're able to you know project that out onto the global stage of actually this is just for our self defense when really uh, like we are right on their borders and and are very openly sort of goading them into war and a lot of the time they stay out of even their quote unquote sphere of influence because they know that we're the only ones willing to use nukes including in places like iran trying to get the the soviets to stop occupying there so um uh, you know there is no shortage of places that will go and there are some less less tasteful or less proper uh, people who are involved with the U.S. deep state at this point. So what are some of the early components of the U.S. deep state that are being activated during this time? Right. Well, you, you don't just have the national security complex that gets that, that emerges in the wake of the or, or, or with the passage of the National Security Act in 1947. You also have this sort of netherworld kind of deep state uh, milieu that uh, emerges from the same forces that were behind the creation of the CIA by and large. So in World War II, even while the fighting is still going on, you had Alan Dulles negotiating Operation Sunrise, uh, the early surrender of the Nazis, uh, which was against, was just totally insubordinate, perhaps treasonous. Um, and he, the, also the, uh, his efforts to recover, you know, Axis gold, uh, which he could use for nefarious purposes. Uh, they rehabilitate, so, so, quote unquote, uh, some of these people after the war who were war criminals. And it's uh, they, they're sort of incorporated into what Peter Dale Scott calls parafascism. Uh, he has a great essay on this from the late 70s, finally uh, published in the in Lobster magazine in the 1980s. But really, these got the some of the worst of the worst of the uh, fascist you know, goons were taken and repurposed. Okay, the Axis itself, the Axis powers were really the anti common turn pact, right? The anti communist international pact. And some of the fascists uh, that they would employ, people like Otto Skorzeny, okay, that he gets picked up and sheltered by the CIA. Klaus Barbie gets rescued, taken off to South America, later emerges to participate in sort of clandestine chicanery um, on, with the CIA and then later with like other even more deniable deep state entities. Uh, Carl Wolf, the, his story, he's an SS officer, war criminal. Uh, his story is well told in David Talbot's Devil's Chessboard, but, you know, Alan Dulles was intervening to try to save him. Reinhard Galen, the Nazi intelligence chief who later becomes the West German intelligence chief, uh, a guy who should have been, you know, hanged as a war criminal, gets employed by the CIA and 
serves in the upper echelons of the West German state after the fact. Um, Yoshio Kodama in Japan, class A war criminal, gets sprung from prison, takes over $100 million in stolen war material to establish uh, the, the Liberal Democratic Party, which is Japan's right wing party, which still essentially runs Japan as a one party state, basically up to the present day. Um, Licio Gelli, probably pronounced that wrong, but the Italian fascist who was a liaison between fascist Italy and Hitler's Germany. And then in the Cold War, he's the venerable master of the Propaganda Due Masonic Lodge, which is more or less like a CIA cutout that combines mafia uh, types, business elites, fascists, <laughs> and so on, uh, to uh, base, to act as a kind of secret deep, a deep state in Italy, more or less. Uh, but really, it's controlled by American forces. Uh, the, the relationship between the mafia and the American deep state uh, goes back before the end of World War II. It's really um, the uh, elites and their connections with the mafia. We've talked about this already, but organized crime has always been, the underworld has always been intertwined with the overworld of you know, capitalist elites. Uh, but in World War II, you have the OSS, which is the CIA precursor. They ha establish Operation Underworld, where they... Uh, take Meyer Lansky and they say, hey, can you help us to control the docks to protect against like sabotage or whatever, perhaps? And uh, Lansky says, uh, okay, you need to spring my friend Lucky Luciano from prison. Uh, and so these two guys who are running the syndicate, which is sort of a transnational or uh, crime, organized crime uh, organization, they are brought in uh, and given state sanction and they're allowed to control the docks. This helps them to reestablish heroin connections uh, later which also involves some of these overworld and intelligence elements. So in Southeast Asia, for example, you have what eventually becomes Operation Paper, which re helps to reestablish the Golden Triangle uh, drug connection after the war. It involves the Kuomintang, which is the nationalist Chinese, uh, the OSS people who were formerly OSS, the Flying Tigers, which was General Cheneau's outfit there. They have an airline and they get financing from the World Commerce Corporation, which was uh, had real big wigs in the American elite, like Nelson Rockefeller, John McCloy, Richard Mellon uh, were backers of it. And Paul Heliwell, the uh, o former OSS guy, CIA connected lawyer down in Florida, close to Meyer Lansky. He was a part of organizing this. William Donovan, the head of the OSS and a Wall Street lawyer. William Stevenson, one of the top British intelligence guys was involved in the World Commerce Corporation. And this whole episode of the World Commerce Corporation establishing these heroin connections after, after World War II in Southeast Asia, which of course later snowballed into the Air America heroin scandal that uh, Peter Dale Scott first uh, exposed, I would say, uh, even though McCoy, Al McCoy gets credit for it. I think he sort of came on after Peter. And um, this, this illustrates the way that like private power and organized crime and the intelligence agencies, even when they weren't intelligence agencies, they were like ex spooks because the CIA didn't exist yet. They created these, this, they have this policy in Southeast Asia. And then once the CIA finally gets authorization to pick the pick up the mantle, then they they do. They these things get folded in. So, you know, where's what's really the the impetus for these alliances between the corporate elite and organized crime and the intelligence agencies? I think you have to trace it back to corporate power and, and corporate wealth that's interested in transnational profits and U.S. hegemony and the protection of capital uh, around the world. That's where you really have to look for uh, for getting at who is in the driver's seat of uh, American policy and who's really steering historical events at, at this time. There's the surface level of what happens in politics, but you can see the <clears throat> the, the deep sort of clandestine world and the overworld uh, and the political elites like like Truman, you know, and Acheson, these connections to the, the Wall Street elites, that these are all coming from like the, a similar force, even the parts that you don't see and the parts that you do see uh, with this deep state uh, system that's emerging in America at this time. And it really overrides democracy in America and uh, leads to this, the kind of criminal, not so morally, uh, you know, uh, strident or, or coherent enterprise that you have to have if you're going to have empire. Empire can't really uh, 
be honest about itself if it's going to be democratic and liberal and adhere to professed American values. So you have you have it presented as not empire, and you have a secret kind of deep clandestine uh, milieu that can also uh, manipulate world events and use violence that it denies after the fact. And this is this gets established very early on, and it's appropriate that something like the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki would be kind of the violent birth of of this whole American empire uh, and the whole enterprise, the, the American century, as it were. That's a great way of putting it. I mean, it, I have one final question. Um, we could end there, but I just want to add a little um, coda to this. What we're talking about today is the creation, the early creation. There's still much more history, but the very beginning stages of the creation of the national security state and this, this institutional apparatus after the end of World War II, we talked about the Council on Foreign Relations. We talked about the, um, you know, the, the National Security Act, which created the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the CIA, the NSA. Um, you know, we, in a previous episode, we talked about different theories of the state in the United States. And we talked about this book by this very mainstream professor, Michael Glennon. And his book is about the U.S. national security state. And he proposes this model of double government that there he acknowledges essentially that there is a double government in his case he refers to to one faction as the madisonian institutions and that would be you know what, what in your model the tripartite state that would be you know the the public state and he he contrasts that glennon this mainstream academic he contrasts that against what he called the trumanite network and i just i just wanted to add a coda here before we conclude you know, it's. Um, I think it's important to kind of uh, to understand. Clearly, you have a critique of Glennon's model. You add the other element of the tripartite state, of the deep state, the you know the public state, and the the national security state. But I'm wondering if we can just conclude here with thoughts of this idea of the Trumanite network, right? Because what we are talking about, it's true. These are institutions that, for the most part, emerged under Truman, and your book is chronological. And you go through each president. So I think in that sense, the Truman presidency is such an important historical moment in the history of the U.S. empire to understand how all these, how all these institutions were created. You mentioned that Truman was kind of this blank slate candidate that he was put in through this coup to prevent Wallace, the, you know, the left wing VP from from being president. Can, can, can you just end? briefly here concluding on this thought of what what a Trumanite is, right? Because we still hear that term today, Trumanite or Trumanism or whatever. Talk about this Trumanite network and, and its role in all of these institutions we just were talking about today. Yeah, I think that's important to focus on. And, and you want to get into the issue of why did Glennon decide to call the national security state the, the Trumanite network? And it's not a you can see why, because all of these institutions basically arise under the presidency of Harry Truman. But there was one general or observer to the whole uh, decision to drop the atom bomb. And he described Harry, he said Harry Truman didn't so much like, um, you know, spearhead that as he just got out of the way. And he went on to say, either he said this or somebody else did, that he was like a little boy on a toboggan. And so I think that that's probably the good metaphor to describe Harry Truman through all of this. And it, it makes it, it complicates the efforts of Glennon to try and say that these things should be called Trumanite because what's tr it's like as though Truman is somehow emblematic of this, but Truman himself was picked not because he showed a lot of initi initiative or independence, but because he was pliable and he would take cues from the establishment. So people like Condoleezza Rice, for example, will say like, oh, Harry Truman was the best president, but he wasn't an exceptionally brilliant person or uh, a really great orator or anything else. His defining characteristic is pretty much his co-optability and the ability to kind of appear sincere, even as he was quite co-opted and co-optable. So Truman is just, uh, you know, the Trumanites are not so much Trumanite. It'd be, you, you, it's hard to know what would be a better term because of the way Glennon formulates it. But it's like, if you look at Truman, you see Truman is not really in the driver's seat. So how could a, why would a Trumanite network really be in the driver's seat? And it's not, it's just the national security state is more of a function of, of Wall Street and capitalism, just as Harry Truman owed his meteoric rise to 
the support of the American oligarchy. And so that's the shortcoming of uh, Glennon's work. And yet you understand why he would leave that out because the oligarchy is so uh, is so significant in the U.S. and denial of the oligarchy is such a, uh, you know, a, a, a fixture of our mainstream ways of understanding and describing uh, politics and history that it's like it's too it's too radioactive or scandalous to actually just point this out because it's like, well, that's kind of like what Marxists say. And so we, we Marxists do not do well in U.S. academia by and large. And so let's just put it on Truman and Trumanites and the national security bureaucracy and not really look any further than that, which is better at least than saying in the U.S. is a democracy, but it still leaves a lot out. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that's the perfect note to end on because it really emphasizes how much of this is structural. And it's not so much about the individual sitting in the Oval Office. It's about these institutions that were created after toward the end of World War II that we were talking about today. And we're going to continue this history going forward. I'm really looking forward to the next part of this, which is going to be about NSC 68 and the rise of the military industrial complex. A lot of very interesting, exciting history here that is so important to understand our world today. But, you know, we try to keep these episodes bite sized around an episode or around an hour each. So we're going to take a break here and we're going to come back in episode 13 and continue this history of the creation of the U.S. national security state. As always, I'm Ben Norton, the multipolarista, and this show is co produced with. One of my favorite podcasts, the American Exception Podcast, and my friends and co-hosts, Aaron Good and Seamus McGinnis. This, as always, this series is based on the book, American Exception, Empire in the Deep State by Aaron. So definitely check out that book. It might, might be fun to read along while you listen. And of course, if you want to check out more of their episodes, go to patreon.com slash American Exception. And you can support my work at patreon.com slash multipolarista. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks a lot.